I formally uh, welcome you all to our webinar and today we are talking about how to make distributed team work and we have Hugo with us who will share his experience working with a distributed team mentoring distributed uh, team and I am Saket and we run at this discuss agile uh, network it's a scrum alliance user group uh, a network and you do earn a lot of SEUs by attending our event so I don't take much time and I will let Hugo introduce himself and take the session uh, forward it's up to you Hugo. my talk today is going to be about how to manage a distributed team successfully and I think this is a topic that most of you guys in India have experience with but I've been working on this for like 10 years um, I have an office in Kochi in India as well as East Europe so I've um, gathered a lot of practical knowledge about managing distributed software development I've got about five topics I'll tell a little bit more about myself first so that everybody knows my background and I'll share a few of the pitfalls that I see for distributed software development as seen from uh, both perspectives so mainly from a Western perspective towards uh, India and I'm, I'm Dutch so I'm in Europe <clears throat> most of my views are Dutch because I don't believe there's any European views then I'll go on to some solutions that I have found to work in again working with distributed teams I'll show you my distributed agile path that I recently created and my distributed team canvas I see a typo there uh, and I'll show you how to use that about myself I did an MBA in Rotterdam in the Netherlands and I graduated there in 2001 and I went on to start a for my first startup because my wish was or my dream was always to start my own company so I did a startup which was in 2001 which was a very big idea for which we needed a lot of venture capital and in 2001 the first internet bubble crashed I'm expecting that the next one will be soon but it hasn't happened yet and this internet so this internet bubble caused most VCs to back out and we couldn't find enough capital soon enough so we had to stop this venture and then I went on to get a job I put here work sucks because I actually intended never to work for any boss or a big company but my mo money was finished at that time this is 15 years back fortunately I, I don't have that problem anymore now uh, but I had to work for a boss for one and a half year to earn a living and I did actually very interesting work I set up an entertainment guide there which taught me a lot about creating the right teams or hiring the right team members and selling stuff which benefited me a lot afterwards in 2004 I made a trip to India because I quit that job and my sister was doing a traineeship in Mumbai and this is me lying in the desert in Rajasthan thinking about my future because I had I had decided I wanted to start my own company and one of the top three opportunities that I had in mind was to start something with outsourcing and I didn't get convinced in Rajasthan because there's not much IT going on over there but in uh, the rest of the country and I traveled three months through India I got convinced that I needed to do something with outsourcing because that's the big thing in India so in 2005 I went on to set up my company Bridge Global and this is the company that I still run right now I have Indian management on it so I'm not spending too much time myself anymore but the basic thing is that we deliver software solutions to clients mainly in Western Europe and we recently started in the US as well so that's also where most of my experience comes from um, then in 2008 I moved to India for one and a half year so this is me in India with a Mundu and my wife in a sari with our two kids on our shoulders I know that this is not a common dress in India to go to office but this was a wedding of one of our colleagues and it was very hot I think it was April or May uh, so I lived there for one and a half year in Cochin to set up our office and after one and a half year I went back and I came uh, once again because I loved India too much so I came another seven months uh, after that last year I decided to transfer the management to my guys in India and they're as I said managing everything and I started Equipa which is a global marketplace for a software team so instead of the traditional service model we've got service firms on the provider side and clients on the 
client side or the buying side, and it's basically inspired by Upwork, uh, but then for larger projects. So we try to match larger projects with teams that have experience building the specific type of solution that a client is looking for. So you've got a sort of trained team or a team that has already worked together on a similar project, and we try to match that with those projects. Uh, uh, the last, last two years I've been writing books about managing remote teams. You can download them for free on the URL that you see in this slide. And the six, six books that I wrote together with experts from all over the world. There is a few Indian people in there as well. And it looks at managing distributed teams from different angles like communication, culture, process. So if you're interested in that, and I hope so because otherwise you wouldn't be in this uh, webinar, I hope you can download them from uh, this URL. And based on this experience of writing the books, I decided to take a Keepa a little bit to a different direction and we started the Keepa Academy this year where we have courses about uh, managing distributed teams, also courses about selling to clients in Western Europe, it's also about strategy, I'll tell you a little bit more later on in this uh, webinar, you can see the URL here, so it's a Keepa.co slash academy. Um, what I agreed is to take questions with each blue screen that I have, which I have every five to eight minutes, I believe. So if there are any questions, feel free to throw them out. But I think right now you might not have anything. I'm not sure where I will get the questions, but I was sure I'm probably going to get a pop-up somewhere. Um, so I'll just go on with the pitfalls. The one thing. So these are all pitfalls that I have experienced occur when a distributed team works together, specifically if you've got a client or a part of the team in the West, and then you've got another part of the team in India. And this can be within a multinational with different locations, but can also be a client-provider relationship. But what often happens is that you get sort of an us versus them mentality. So people in, for example, the Netherlands work with a team in India, and they believe we over here uh, see things this way and they over there, those Indians, that's, that's terminology that you often hear, uh, they made the mistake. So you get sort of a separation between the teams and I think this is one of the most disastrous things that can happen in a team because as soon as I recognize this and when I talk to people about their challenges in distributed teams, this always pops up and I hear it from the words. If they say they, they or them, this is kind of an indication of this divide that you have between the two locations and that's a moment you need to start addressing uh, that issue because it can be culture, it can be process, whatever it is, but something needs to be done. Uh, the second pitfall, this doesn't seem to work all the time, is uh, preparation. And with that I mean that usually if you, for example, have a multinational that has different locations, they, one location is used to work in a certain way and they don't take the time to sort of reflect on the way they are working. So they go with the flow, they go with the routines that they have built in the previous years working together, but they forget to stand still and sort of rethink how they are going to organize now that part of the team is remote. And if there is a client provider relationship, this is even more so because you've got usually a software development team in the client side that has certain routines, they may work in Scrum, they may have certain tools that they use, but they are not used to work with people in another location, and they don't take the time to think about how they are going to work, and instead of that they go, they get to the work as they've always done it. And I also, you know, a lot of teams forget to address the cultural things. Now, I also believe cultural differences may be exaggerated, like we can blame anything that goes wrong in the project and culture, but I do think it's important to address it so that there is a common understanding and people can share ways to organize around the differences that everybody recognizes. The third one I always uh, talk about is the black box and this happens specifically if you have more traditional software development or waterfall is pro processes where somebody onshore, a client onshore sends requirements to a team in India and then the team makes an estimate, analyzes the project, says this is the price, this is the delivery date and then the client will just sit, sit back and relax and wait till it comes back and that's usually not the case where it doesn't come back in time or not as specified and um, I think this is because of the black box where a client doesn't see what 
process the team in India uses, what people are working on it, so it's all unclear what happens. And this is one of the major benefits, in my opinion, about Agile, because this is way more about the team. I'll get back to that later on, but it's about the team, and you open up towards the client so that this black box is not existing anymore. Now, I've got a few pitfalls that are sort of based on culture. I shared these also in the presentation I gave a month back in uh, Cochin where we had an outsourcing conference and I believe that in the Indian specific, like this, this maybe this pitfall is, is valid for any culture but specifically for India. What, what clients in the West always talk about or at least in Europe is that they expect productivity from their team members. And now the issue with this productivity is that this can be understood in a different way by different people because in India you might think productivity is that you check up, you send a, a daily update to your clients or you do your daily stand up. Whereas me as a Dutch, for example, if I look at productivity, what I mean is that I expect my teammates to share their ideas, to come up with suggestions on how we can do the work that we do together better, as well as the specific tasks or projects that we are working on. So to add thoughts, to add brain power to the team and the projects we're working on. And I think there is a very big mismatch often between West and East in this productivity expectations, because it's not a normal or very important value in the Indian culture as I have found it. Productivity is not something that you think about daily, whereas especially people in Northern Europe find this incredibly important. Number five is time. And what I always believe here, somebody else phrased it very well in my opinion a few weeks back, is that in India you perceive I'm a, of course again this is a generalization, but uh, in India people perceive time as a circle. So I get today and I go through my 24 hours and today is another and tomorrow there's another circle so it's okay tomorrow we can do it again whereas in Europe people see it more linear so if I have a deadline today I think in terms of a graph or a line so tomorrow is not it's not today and I want something to be finished today and if you commit to that then it needs to be finished today there is no tomorrow so I think there is often a clash between this sort of attitude towards time. And again, it does not necessarily need to be a problem as long as you address this so that it is clear from both sides and you can find ways to organize around this. Number six, and these are my shoes. I actually took this picture in India. This is a thing about quality. So I had actually walked in um, Amsterdam with one of my friends who came to India with me to the conference and my left shoe lost the heel. Now I walked around there on the central station and within a few minutes I found a shoe shop who could actually fix my shoe. Now this guy looked at me and he said okay I'm gonna fix this very solidly so he put glue on on the surface of the uh, heel then he put it under it he put a few screws in it and I really saw it was fixed very solidly. Now in India the same thing happened but with my right shoe. So I go to this guy who's sitting on the street and he's, you know, a, an Indian shoe shop and the guy took it and he starts putting in a nail and then he finds out it's too short so he pulls it out again and then looks for a bigger nail and starts hammering down those uh, bigger nails. Now I do a lot of construction work in my house myself because construction work is very expensive over here and all that so I don't hire people to do it but I do it myself and I consider that putting glue and screws in it is much more solid than putting some some nails into it. Now fortunately both are still uh, okay right now but I find this very symbolic, symbolic for the attitude or the view on quality that different cultures have because the guy in Holland, the shoe shop, the shoe shop thought I'm going to fix it in such a way that this guy is never going to come back and the guy in India thinks I'm, I'm just making it, I'm fixing it for the moment, but he doesn't consider the longer term. And for me as a Westerner, I could really see the quality perspective. And I think it's, you can see this from a lot of uh, angles. And in software development, you've got similar things. That, that the attitude towards quality is sometimes different. And again, this does not need to be a problem, although, of course, this is at the basis of your service firm or the, like whatever you do as a team, you need to de deliver quality. But again, you need to discuss that with a client so that both sides 
have a diff have the same expectation around quality. We've got a blue slide, so if there's any questions, I hope I'm going to see some chatter pop up. Um, but I'm not getting anything right now. Yeah. Yeah, we we do have have few, so I'm just uh, 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 assigning uh, you. So you will see a pop-up. We just have one as of now. Uh, and if you are not able to see it, I can read it. Managing a distributed team in a scrum and scale agile are same or different. Do we have a different approaches to manage the team in a particular methodology? So that was the question. OK, please repeat it once more. I'm trying to wrap around my brain around it. Yeah, so uh, what is, is the question is that managing a distributed team in a yeah. in a methodology like Scrum or a framework like Scrum, or managing it in a scaled agile, is there any difference? So, do we treat managing distributed team differently in a Scrum versus scaled agile framework? To be honest, I don't know that much about scaled agile, but what I know is that Scrum is basically a very simple methodology to structure software development, and it's usually done at the team level, whereas scaled agile goes a level above. So they try to figure out if we have several Scrum teams, how do we organize that within a bigger company or a bigger setup? So I think they go hand in hand. But again, I don't know, maybe you know more about skilled agile, but that's the way I look at it. So I don't, I, you know, they go hand in hand, there's no contradiction in that. Yeah, Does maybe post-solution we can discuss, uh, but yeah, I, I think as of now we can move with that. So I'm, I'm assigning few more, if you can see the pop-up. Okay. It's strange because I don't see the pop-up actually, okay, I see no the problem. chat on the right I, side. Yeah, I, I will just read it. Uh, so uh, it, it, the, the, the questions which I'm getting is more about framework specific, so I feel that we can take them at the end. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, there is one of which you may like to consider is is talking about how can you justify the pitfall you you took us through are really the problem areas in distributed team session here. So how do you generalize that it could be just your experience? So that's the question is. So to be honest, I, I usually speak from my own experience and at the same time I've spoken to a lot of clients, a lot of peers within the distributed agile and distributed software development space. I've written those books. So these are sort of common threats that come back. But I know like the one that I shared about quality, about uh, time, I, these are generic things that I came up with. It's my, it's my own vision. So don't feel offended by it. It's just the way I see it as Dutch with my experience. And of course, there are more specific ones. We did a poll before this webinar, which dealt more with, with Scrum, with time differences. These are the sort of obvious things that are challenges in a distributed team. Yeah? But the things I have shared here are less obvious, more below the surface. So I try to create awareness around this. But of course, they don't need to be hold true in any situation. You know, Quality is a generic thing. True. I think we can move ahead and we can look at uh, questions later. Okay. So, on the solution side, I also start with a couple of generic things. And the first one that I always speak about is the focus on people because I believe this is often forgotten. There are challenges in distributed teams where people usually go to a process or to a certain methodology to solve it. But in the end of the day, it's all about getting the right people. Because again, if we take an example of a client outsourcing part of the software development to a team in India, the, it's very important to have somebody unsure, the product owner or whatever, the, the unsure manager, whatever you call the guy, who is experienced in managing remote teams. If you've got somebody that has been working in this environment for five years as a product owner with distributed teams, your you're likelihood of making things work are much bigger because a lot of problems that I've seen are with clients that do, do are like people unsure that don't have that experience and they are sort of forced to work with people remotely and from that you get a lot of issues. So I, I think on both sides and of course this is also true on the Indian side 
having said that, I also believe that the experience is usually bigger in India because the outsourcing experience is large. So a lot of people that work in this industry have worked remotely or in a distributed way. The, the, the population in India of developers and managers is also maturing. So you, you get a sort of imbalance, but I think it's important to get that right. And it's also important to really build one team. And I always see one team as, you know, the, 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 the whole team distributed, no matter what location you're on, should feel like one. They should operate in a scrum or agile way, and everybody has certain roles, but they act as one team. And again, this is a sort of countermeasure of the us versus them pitfall that I've spoken before. And I, I'll get to some more practical solutions later on. The second that I, and again, this is a personal thing, that I believe is really crucial in making the uh, distributed teams work is empathy and especially in a technology environment where a lot of people try or prefer to talk with a PC or uh, with data instead of human beings it's important to have a couple of people on both sides that are empathic and I always believe that this empathy plays out on several levels so if you for example look at this empathy plan that I'm sharing here I you have you, you, as, a, as a company or as a team, you need to stimulate empathy on the cultural part. So you need to make people curious about the other culture so that you can sort of understand everybody in the team better. You also need to stimulate empathy for the company that if there's a team in India working for a multinational with offices everywhere, that the Indian team also gets curious about the vision and the mission of the company. So, And if you have one or two people in the team that are empathic, they will be more inclined and curious to figure out what the company is about. Because if I don't understand what the company, be it a client or the, comp or the, the company I'm employed by, really does in the world, uh, what, what, their, what their purpose is. I mean, this is dry MBA talk, vision, vision, values, but I think it's about really understanding what this company is about. It will make for better software. It will make for a better understanding among the team members. So it's very important to stimulate this stuff. And it's, it's also sometimes hard for a remote team to think about. Uh, these kind of things because they're far away, uh, far away, sort of isolated. And this this also plays out in the product. So, what I've seen often happen is that a product, for example, is developed by an onshore team, and they have been working as a team for several years on that specific software product. Now they have to get a few extra team members, and they start or hire a team in India. And these people are far away, and they might not understand what the product is about, what people use it for. They don't get client feedback, so they are sort of in the dark about the details of the product. And this is often forgotten by the onshore team as well as the offshore team, because the onshore team talks about this every day around coffee. They have discussions. They sort of live and breathe this product. And they don't understand what kind of knowledge they need to transfer to the offshore team to make them really have the same level of understanding. And it's very hard to get that. Uh, and the offshore team thinks in terms of technology. So they dive into the code base, the architecture, but they forget that if their team members don't really understand what the product is used for, that it's sometimes hard to figure out if I create a certain page or functionality and I push a button and I go to the next page, what, what's going to happen there? Or if, I, or if I have to test a certain part of the application, how would a user really perceive this, this software or this screen? And yeah, I think that that's maybe even the most important part in this empathy plan, that you make the whole team have, get a very deep knowledge about the product. And it's what I see a lot of people do is to send over people from India to, for, it could be a, an architect or a business analyst, he goes to onshore for a few weeks and he gets the product understanding. But if this guy goes away, then it's lost again. So I think it has to go beyond that. It needs to be about wikis, about videos, about you know trainings. Um, there needs to be a lot of investment there. And then the last part I think where empathy plays out is on the team level. So if you have empathic people on both sides, they will be more inclined to really create bonding among the team members. And you need that on both sides because otherwise you again get this sort of isolation on one of the, one of the sides and you get two teams instead of one. So the team can think about the team's values, the mission, uh, what kind of, how do, how do you build a team spirit, how do, you, how do you meet up, what kind of travel plan do you have. The third one 
is again a generic one, and after this I'll go to the specifics, is about alignment and, and, and openness. So again, what I often see is that you just go with the flow, companies organize and work the way they have always done, instead of taking a step back and start aligning about how do they work. And another thing that I have also noticed that there's often a lack of openness, that there are issues, for example, I, I still, like this morning I had that with my own Indian team in Akiva, so I've got a few girls in my uh, in, in my office in Kochi, and um, we're moving to a new office, and my team needed to move to that new office, but they had some concerns about this because they didn't want to sit among all the other people because they have to do a lot of phone calls and they might disturb them, but they didn't express that to me, uh, and I found out via, via another way. So what I always believe is that the openness among all the team members is incredibly important. For me as a Dutch, for example, openness is one of the most important values in our culture. We want everybody to be open in their ideas because I always believe if people share what concerns them or what matters to them or where they are stuck, then at least we can talk about it and try to find a solution instead of somebody staying in the dark and not sharing this with me. So I believe that this openness is one of the core values that you need to stimulate within a distributed team. So uh, I do have a few more questions, uh, so uh, yeah, let me, I think this is a good time to talk about them. Yeah. So I am assigning to you. So what I'm getting right now is, okay, you're doing them one by one. Okay, so for an agile development team of eight with two members in the US and six in India, this is a question from Sanjay Kumar, what would your quick list of recommendations? So. I'll park that one because I'm going to share a few of the tools that we have in our distributed agile path which you can actually apply to your situation. So I think you're going to get the answer to that. Moit asks, do you use quality team for software developed in agile? What I think you mean is do you have some sort of QA or testing team if the software is developed using Scrum or in an agile way? And I think this is really dependent on the situation, you know. I see different ways, like I've got one client who has their software, most of the software developers are in Holland, then they've got a team of ours in uh, Kiev in Ukraine, and they've got 20 testers in Delhi. So they work with three different locations, and they've sort of synced the whole Scrum process between those locations. Uh, I, I believe that right now they the developers in Kiev finish a certain part of their sprint, and then in the last day, the testers in India start, so they have feedback and they can finalize it, or maybe the day before the sprint. I don't know exactly, but and then, and then I think Scrum basically says you need to have a multidisciplinary team where you have testers inside the team, which I think is generally a very ideal way because you again you have one team where the testers are part of it, and I've even seen teams where in the last one or two days they test uh, together, so they will gather with the whole team around one PC, the, they will go through the user stories, and the guy that made this functionality will just click through or show what he's built, so that the whole team can look at it and start testing it. I think this is really, I mean, this is this, in a distributed setting that might be a challenge, but you could do that if the product owner is unsure, you've got the Scrum team, including testers, offshore. Okay, but I think that there's no prefix formula for this. Then Sanjay asks, what are some of the proven, proven ways to deal with time zone differences? Yeah, I saw that this was one of the challenges that many people came up with. Now, to be honest, from Europe, you do not have this problem, because actually India is in, in, a, in a perfect time, time zone to work with Europe, but for the US, it, it is an issue. And I don't think there is a perfect way around this. It's all about having good handovers and creating some slack where you have a window of, of doing the daily stand-up. I think that's the most important thing. If you have time zones that really don't overlap, you can always find 15 or let's say 20 minutes where your team can align in, the, in a daily stand-up and the rest needs to be communicated through an online Scrum tool or project management tool. Um, let me see what other questions. We've got a lot of questions. How do we coach distributed teams? That's an interesting one. I, so what, what, what I have done in my own setting in Bridge is to not assign a agile coach but more of a process manager. So you have 
one part of the team in Holland, for example, one team, one part of the team in India, and then you've got a process manager who's responsible for the communication between the two locations. So he's not involved in the project details. He doesn't know really about the task and what everybody's working on, but he monitors from a process perspective. So are the people aligned? Is there a team spirit? Is you know are they? So and and one of the things they do is every week. This process manager will have a talk with the product owner and the scrum master, or whatever roles you want to have in the call, and he will ask to both sides, "What is your sort of temperature? What do you what do you subjectively think about the collaboration this week on a scale of one to ten? And with that, you have the opportunity to each week figure out how the team is collaborating and find measures. Like if the, if one of the sides says it's a six this week, while well, last week it was a nine, you can start asking about the issues that led him to say that it's a six and then figure out ways as a team to get around that. You could also do this in a retrospective, of course, but um, I think it's important to have some function like that, somebody who can do it as a sort of outsider and coach the team from both sides, but uh, maybe it can also be an agile coach. What does distribution team means only US and India? Uh, that's a question from Pijaya. Well, I I never really think that, like, we had this poll question, what is a distributed team? And I have this discussion with a lot of people, but I think as soon as you've got somebody working remotely, it, it is a distributed team because you have to, like, if the, some experts in our industry say, okay, if there's one guy working remotely, then ev everybody should work as if he's sitting remotely because otherwise you're going to sort of isolate that one guy. But I see different settings. I would say that if you have a product owner in the US and the development team, including the Scrum Master offshore, that is a distributed team as well because that product owner is part of the Scrum team and he needs to collaborate with them somehow. So I would say unless everybody is in the same room or maybe in the same building, but even some people say the same, like two floors in the same building is already distributed, I think it's a distributed team. Time barrier I have answered. Um, Deepika asks about openness. How do we ensure it? In a, how do we ensure in team? Is there any way to do? Reasons for this question is I have my team where they are not interested in attending meetings with the team. How do we resolve, resolve this issue? Yeah, that's that's um, okay. So. I had that same question to, last week when I did a training in, in Kiev and there were some people who were saying yes that some people just refused to do some calls or to join a certain meeting. I don't know. If I if it were my team then I would force them to do it. Because I think especially in India you have a right to just say, Okay, I'm the boss, you have to get into that meeting and just do it and stop complaining because it's important. But from a more positive point of view, I think you could discuss and address this in a retrospective and let everybody, like every stakeholder, onshore and offshore, talk about the importance for uh, the individual of openness of everybody joining that specific team. Um, one thing that I have found to work, which may be a valuable tip, is to have a online tool for retrospectives where people can actually openly discuss their concerns, have all the time and it can be a scrum board, it can be a sticky note tool and people can post their concerns or issues maybe anonymously in a retrospective board, could even be a start, stop, continue board and then in the retrospective you can go through all those issues one by one. So this has the benefit that people who don't like to express in voice or openly about their concerns, uh, they might do it anonymously by writing it down. So I have found that that sometimes works. I hope that answers Deepika's questions. Um, I see two more questions and I'll, then I'll go on. I am, that's a question from Crunchy. I am working as a project manager where the developer team is in the US and the manual QA is in India. Coordination, oh wait, coordination becomes an issue due to time reference. Okay, so this is time reference. I've addressed this already. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Ayub Khan says, what are the popular tools being used in the industry for managing distributed team. Okay. 
I had a slide about tools in my deck, but I have removed that because I always assume that it's sort of obvious. But I do have one slide on a generic level, so I'll show that later on, and so I think I'm going to ask, answer your question. I will go on with my presentation now, and I'll take the other questions uh, later on. So I want to share, because this, you, you guys are all in a agile community, I thought of addressing agile or the way I see agile contribute to distributed teams. And I see there's a lot of hype and talk about agile. But what I, what I think is really important is that agile has some sort of mindset shift once people get it or once people get a training and get into this agility. Because it's, it's, it's almost like flexibility, where people are more flexibly organizing as a team instead of having like fixed roles or fixed ideas. So I, I believe it helps to let the whole company or whole team let go of the step-by-step -step processes. So where previously the software industry thought you can go with a step-by-step -step sort of architectural or construction kind of way, right now everything is about iterations and it's way more flexible so it helps the team to let go of this idea that step-by-step -step processes follow one two three and then you'll succeed works and it also helps to let go of hierarchy because in a scrum team you don't have hierarchy or at least it's not, supp not supposed to be there I believe agile also helps to cross the hierarchy which is sometimes ingrained in a certain culture I, for, from my experience in the Indian culture, hierarchy plays a very important role, and a lot of companies are structured along those lines. So we've got uh, a software developer, then we've got a team lead, we've got a project manager, an account manager, and the account manager might talk to the client, but the software developer does not. So in a Scrum, if you organize Agile, you've got a Scrum team, and actually everybody needs to talk to each other, so the hierarchy is gone. So I think this helps to overcome this cultural issue. It also helps you to let go of the fixed roles that sometimes exist because what I've seen is that if you have the traditional way of organizing, or, and this is also something that I have found to be sort of a challenge or a fact of life in India, that a lot of people think I can, for example, do PHP. And if I need to do HTML, then I need to go to my colleague because I cannot do HTML. Or if I need to get something tested, that's not my responsibility, that's the tester's responsibility. Now, Scrum or Agile says you need to be sort of multidisciplinary, you need to be multifunctional. So the whole team needs to take the role that is important at this certain stage because as a team you made a commitment. So I also believe that this can help to make people more flexible and get higher results because, of course, if, if the programmer doesn't want to test, then a project might get stuck, right? Because we were waiting for the tester to test stuff at the end of the cycle, and he might be doing that right now for another project. So if everybody can test, uh, it, it becomes much more easy to make the commitments. And to sum it up, the, I believe the value of Agile is that you can let teams figure stuff out. So it's all about the team, and I believe also that the team should be the two locations together. I've seen said that before, but I believe that's really an important notion that people start seeing teams as onshore and offshore, no matter if it's one company or it's a client-provider relationship. So um, I miss one figure here, but the thing that I have developed is a distributed agile path, and this path basically has four steps, and these steps are aimed at both the multinational that has different locations or distributed teams among different locations as well as the client provider uh, relationship. So we've got one module around value creation and strategy. Oh sorry, there's a, okay, this was the figure that I wanted to show. So we've got marketing and sales, we've got uh, strategy and value creation, culture and communication and delivery. And the top two are more for service providers offering services to, to customers and I believe from the 96 people we have today some of you probably work in a service firm. And the bottom is the delivery and culture and communication, which is valid for any site. So it's a client or it's a multinational. This is important. So in each module, we offer specific uh, trainings. And we also have a lot of tools that we use. And these tools are freely available. So they're not, some of them are developed by ourselves. But this one, the Business Model Campus, is a tool developed by a Swiss guy, uh, Alexander Osterwalder. If you Google this, you can actually find this canvas and you can play with it. So this is on the strategic level where a, 
service firm, but it could also be used for a product. So if you work in a multi, like if you work in a distributed team on one product for a multinational or for a software product firm from the US, for example, you can use this to figure out the strategy around that product or the service you're offering. So you have to gather your managers around this. Um, I'm getting a pop up here. You, you need to manage the, you, you gather your managers around this uh, canvas and you could for example say okay what we decided is that we're going to service insurance companies in Germany. Uh, so you would say the customer segments are insurance, uh, insurance companies in Germany. Then you can go on to the channels that you can use to reach those Clients, so you need to figure out with the team how can we reach out to those people? How do we build customer relationships with them? What kind of partners do we need to service those uh, insurance companies? And what's our value proposition, which we have in the middle? So you have you can put sticky notes around how do we change our value or service model uh, that we offer to the clients? And for example, if you say I want to operate in Germany, what what does it mean to our cost structure if we need to open an office somewhere in Germany? So that's a business model canvas. Uh, we're actually doing a, a uh, online course about this on the 17th and 26th of May. So you can go to equipa.co slash academy because the URL is a bit long here, but you can find it from that path. And this is a live uh, online course that I'm going to do without, with uh, Hans Gartner, a senior guy. He's 62, so he's got a great amount of experience about strategy and using the business model canvas. So if you're interested in that, I hope to meet you again there. On the marketing and sales side, I always believe this is all about teaching certain skills. So I'm not sure how relevant it is for you guys because you're on the agile more on the delivery side, I believe, but we are doing a intercultural sales cycle session in uh, next month, 12, 13, 14 May, May. And this is specifically for Indian companies. Uh, my, my American co-founder, uh, Jennifer Roberts is going to do that, so you can see the dates here, and again, you can go to the academy to, to enroll there. On the culture and communication side, I've developed one tool that I think might be interesting for some of you. Um, this is the culture map, and this is a tool I recently developed, and how it works is if you have a team with different cultures or different locations, you need to gather the people in ideally in one room, but you could also do it in two locations. So for example, I'm a Dutch guy. I work with a couple of people that are part of a team that works with some people in India. So let's say we have uh, Holland and India. Now I will fill this from my perspective. So in the middle, we've got person from Holland. That's me or my together with my colleagues. And we are going to fill this culture map about uh, working with our colleagues in India. So what I'm going to do is I look at the perspectives that I have in the bottom, like quality, productivity, creativity, and I'm going to put sticky notes on this canvas around quality. So, for example, I have uh, the, 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 on the left side we've got here. So what do I hear from my colleagues about the quality that we deliver as a team or that we deliver having some people from India in our team? What do I as a person think and feel about up collaborating with my Indian colleagues. I might say, for example, that I love working with Indians because they're always very uh, open and they are very friendly and we've got a very good atmosphere within the team. And I might also feel um, enthusiastic about it because I love working with different cultures. Th these are true things, so that's what I would put on this board actually. And I could also put what kind of pains and gains I have in working with an Indian team or with part of my team in India. Now, the, the, so this, and the second part is the people from India are going to do the same thing. So then the India part says I'm a person from India and how do I think about working with people from Holland? So you might, for example, say uh, in the say and do section, I believe that the Dutch guy is very blunt. So he sometimes says things that sort of hurt me, like you can put that on. And I hear from my other colleagues that they have often difficulties talking to um, the Dutch guys because uh, it's it's sort of far away and they don't dare to open up. So with that you get a whole uh, canvas with all the different perspectives from both sides about each other's culture and then you can gather them together. So you start discussing all the post-its 
And maybe you can make a top five, for example, of things that stand out from this session and that are the top five things that need to be addressed by the team. And as a team, you can then find ways to organize around these cultural challenges. So this creates awareness, understanding from both sides, and even practical organizational actions to deal with the cultural differences. And I could share the slides, uh, these slides with you later on. We don't have this culture map online yet, but if you want to get it, you could also drop me an email. On the delivery side, and this is one of the most important tools that I have developed, that's the distributed team canvas. And this is actually a, a tool on the team level. So you've got a team, again, let's say US and India, and they need to align. And they use this tool to align on all the expectations on eight aspects. And these eight blocks are basically the building blocks of a distributed team as I have found it. And among me, uh, the people that I have worked with and written the books with. So what the team can do here is to, again, make a sticky note session where they go through each of those uh, blocks and usually you have to start with the process so we're going to look at how do we work right now what's our process do we use certain steps do we use scrum or agile and if we use scrum how do we do this what's our meeting rhythm uh, what kind of communication rhythm do we have so we map out the process with sticky notes and we start uh, thinking about actions that we as a team can implement to make the collaboration better we can also go to performance and metrics where I'm going to map out what kind of metrics do we use on an individual uh, level and on the team level. So do we use velocity? Do we also have some KPIs to measure individual performance like coding quality or communication skills? So we could even rate each other. We can add this sort of subjective measure that I shared earlier where we say on a scale of 1 to 10, what do we think about the collaboration? So you can go on to go through all these blocks to align and have clear expectations. And you will see that once you've thought about this, how we're going to work, it is going to be much easier to work as one team and have clarity on, on all the issues. And you can also uh, have a retrospective around this canvas to see if you're still aligned. If, if issues arise, then you could discuss what did we agree initially and do we need to change something to our sort of social contract that we develop with this canvas. Uh, I've got some deeper things about the canvas, but I think we've got only about 15 minutes left, 10 minutes, so I suggest we go back to the questions. So I'll start with Shakti Kurana. There are two teams at different locations. One is having three, another is having five team members. As a Scrum Master, I can see that collaboration is missing between the teams. What should a Scrum Master do for handling such situation? Um, so, my biased uh, answer in this case would be that it makes sense to use this canvas and have the team gather, if it's not possible to do that physically, do it virtually, so you can have an online version of this distributed team canvas. I've got a version where I've got it in Google Docs, so if you want that I could share it with you. And start mapping this out, because what you'll see is that the team, like, the basic assumption I think you need to have is that this team consisting of five members on two locations can figure out a way to make the work better. And if you give them the responsibility and the tools to figure out how to improve, then I think they will come up with their own solution. So this, this canvas can actually help them to structure their thinking because they will start with thinking through their process, they will think about performance, they will think about what kind of new tools could be used to improve, etc. And you'll see that the team members also start sharing ideas with each other, and this will help the team to improve. And, and I think one thing that is important there is to have some sort of action plan. So you could, for example, use yellow sticky notes to map out all the ideas and then put, uh, you know, orange notes to make concrete actions so that the team can also check in the retrospective that we implement those changes. I hope that helps. Then I've got a question from Shahid Ahmad here. How to manage daily Scrum in a distributed system using scaling agile? Um, I'm not sure if I got the question right, so I'm going to pass on that one. Um, um, because actually I don't see the issue. If you, like if you if you have a daily Scrum in a distributed like the daily Scrum should happen, and I don't think it matters if you have skill, a skilled situation or not, because each team individually needs to have their daily stand-up about their specific project. Um, 
and if you have skilled Scrum, again, I don't know much about each of those methodologies, but I think you could have the Scrum of Scrums where the Scrum masters talk to each other to align in another daily stand-up. If that, I hope that answers the question a bit. So Kranti asks, if we do have people uh, doing multiple roles, don't you think there is a risk of people writing code without analyzing the complete impact? For example, control-related changes. Um, yes. And again, if the team is responsible for the commitment, then you would expect the team to deliver on the expectations that the, they created aligned with the expectations of the product owner. And if there are issues occurring in certain user stories because the programmer started testing but he didn't test it accurately, then it will come up somewhere in the demo or the retrospective and the team can reorganize around this. And I do see the point because, of course, there's a risk. But all I'm saying is that it helps a team if people become more open-minded. I was in Pivotal Labs in San Francisco a few years back, and I saw that one of their policies was we only hire programmers, for example, if they are ready to learn different technologies. Of course, they try to hire people that already know a variance of technologies, but if they don't because they're more junior, they are sort of required to be open to learning different uh, technologies because one project they might work in .NET and then the next project they have to work in Ruby and they need to be open to learning that. The way they practically solved that was by pair programming. So if somebody came in and didn't know Ruby but he does know .NET, then he would pair program in somebody that does know and by doing that he learns it. But I think it's more about the attitude and the openness towards this flexibility. Ratan asks, how will the culture map help if I have distributed teams from different vendors? Um, so you mean to have different cultures, like you don't have two cultures but more than that, and that is indeed an interesting question. I would say that what you could try is to have you know, six instances of this culture map and everybody fills it around about each other, but what you could also consider is to have one canvas and then have the whole team share their ideas about their, in, like maybe maybe it's more about addressing the specific issue. So the whole team with six different cultures, whatever it is, they will address the challenges that they face working in this multicultural uh, team. So I could feel my concerns working with anyone or with a team in general or with a specific culture and just started putting posters. I think the team will then come up with the top five issues that they need to address to organize around it. Because, and and I, th I mean, my expectation will be that in a lot of cases it will probably come down to the categories that Hofstede, for example, has uh, developed. I'm assuming that Hofstede is a familiar term, otherwise uh, Google it. He's got six categories or sort of baskets in which he puts cultural differences. So hierarchy or power distance is one of them. So it's likely that hierarchy or power distance issues will surface and then the team can start discussing that. But I think it's not so much about following this culture map literally, but addressing it, to have the team, give the team the tools to sort of discuss and think about those cultures or the, the difference in it, or the similarities maybe. So I see one more question from uh, Mohit. How can we keep offshore team motivated? Um, that's, of course, a generic uh, question, but I think it all depends on the setting. You know, it's, if it's client provider, then a lot of this responsibility is, of course, on, on, on the provider side. If I look at my own situation with Bridge, I've got my team in, in India with uh, only Indian people, and then they've got their clients they work for in, in Sweden and the Netherlands and the U.S., and we do a lot of stuff on our office, on our sites, like trips and having a specific sort of Western culture, doing a lot of, like, we, we try to build culture there. This is harder for a client to do. If it's one company, it might be easier because you've got the facilities to just move back and forth. But, you know, it's, um, I would, if, if this question, I, I, I don't know exactly if I have answered anything, anything that helps there, but I think motivation is a very generic thing. One, one tool that pops up for me that might be used alongside this distributed team canvas is uh, the team canvas. If you Google that, you'll find probably, I think it's team, team canvas or the teamcanvas.com, 
And this is another uh, canvas developed by some, I think, Ukrainian guys that live in Holland. They work for Philips, and they have made this canvas on on really the emotional side. So it's more about values. What is the purpose of our team? How do you, like what are the, the the soft sides? So I think it might help to uh, use that canvas to create some sort of you know motivation and align them core values, for example, which is, I think values is another thing. You, you've got another thing that pops up is um, you've got a tool from the Management 3.0 uh, body of knowledge, and that's called Moving Motivators. And he, uh, that's a Dutch guy again who developed that. He's got, I think, eight or ten uh, cards. You can print it out, so you've got eight or ten cards around core values, generic core values. And you need to sort them in a certain way. So if you Google mo moving motivators, you will find that game. You can download it for free, and maybe that's something you could play with your team. I think I have addressed all the questions, which is great. Good. Great, great. Thank right. you. Thank you for taking time out for this this uh, webinar. I've added my contact details here. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions around the tools that I've shared, or I could even facilitate one of the sessions around the canvases, for example. Here's my details. Uh, Google Hugo Messer, and I'm almost the only one, I guess, so you will find me. Thank you, Hugo. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Yeah. Thanks, friends, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Hugo. Okay. See you. Bye-bye.